Um, I want to say something about being a student, uh, not only when you're at university, but your whole life. And I want to say that with reference to somebody um, that I quite revere. Many years ago, when I did my doctorate, um, it was just after I had read a biography of a French philosopher called Michel Foucault. Um, and my doctorate in the end was about his work. The reason why I chose him was because he was gay, like me. Um, he passed away uh, of complications because of uh, HIV, um, like me. I'm not passed away, but still. And um, I read this biography and I was absolutely fascinated by it, especially when I uh, discovered that he had written three books on the history of sexuality, um, and that he had written these books after he had went into the desert taking LSD, <laughs> which was quite surprising that an academic that is so famous would do that. But the real reason why I was captivated by this person was, well, there were two reasons. The first one is that his work said that you, when you are trying to think about the world, it's one thing to try uh, uh, to, to just go along and to think this is right, this is wrong with what, how the world is. But I want to read a quote which I thought captures some of what he said. So for a moment it's going to be a bit serious. And I have to put on my glasses because otherwise I cannot see anything. Um, and he said, a critique is not a matter of saying that things are not right as they are. It is a matter of pointing out on what kinds of assumptions, what kinds of familiar, unchallenged, unconsidered modes of thought, the practices that we accept rest. And what he meant by that is that we often do not have the imagination to think completely differently from everything that we see around us and that we are taught. In this moment in which the term of decoloniality is very um, present, I think that is a very important lesson to learn, that we are often, say Foucault, in a very different context, of course, because he's French, but in a very different context, he said, we have to be we have to really try and think about what it is that we cannot really think about because we were not taught the words, we were not taught the concepts, and we have to completely reimagine what the world is about. Um, and we have to reimagine what it is possible to think. So for students, and I think you're a student when you're at university, but you're a student for the rest of your life, and that is for me a very important lesson, that one has to um, always ask, so why am I thinking this? What is making me think this? Isn't there another way? Is there, are there other ways that it is possible to be in the world and to think that is not constrained by the current um, worldview or what other people actually believe. And so for me that is quite important. Second, the second thing that he also said that grabbed me at the time was that we are in many ways, we are all disciplined by the world that we live in by the way, by the gaze of other people, gaze not as in G-A-Y, but G-A-Z-E. So the, the gaze that, that um, ju judges you and tells you, this should not be possible. This is not possible because it's not the right way of doing things. And uh, Foucault wrote a lot about how we have to resist that disciplining force. Um, and I was reminded of this uh, just this week when I went to the opening of an uh, exhibition at the uh, District 6 Homecoming Center. And the opening was uh, uh, um, an exhibition about the life of QP. QP was born a boy in District 6. I think
think in today's language we would call QP. Uh, the pronoun that QP might uh, choose would be they. Uh, QP was um, uh, gender non-conforming in many ways. And this was in the 1950s and the 1960s, in a world of apartheid oppression, in a world that, in which there was no freedom for people like him who was black, and there was also no freedom for people who were um, desired people of the same sex, like he did, and there were definitely no freedom for people who were gender non-conforming. Yet, if you go, go to that exhibition, and I think all of you should go to that exhibition, it is so moving to see that this person, through sheer will, uh, through the sheer will that he had of his own personality, that he made for himself a space of freedom in the sea of unfreedom. And that is, for me, a profound lesson um, that all of us, I think, uh, could learn. And that is that, yes, there are so many things that tries to discipline you, that gaze, that tries to discipline you, that tries to say there is only one way of being in the world or a certain kind of acceptable ways of being in the world. And that often limits what the possibilities that we have. But there, there isn't actually. If you really um, have the will to do it, you can will for yourself, even in unfreedom, even in very limited ways, because they, it's always a little bit difficult. You can will for yourself a space of freedom. And if you go to the exhibition, you'll see QP uh, going to balls, dressed as, I, I thought it was very hilarious, he was dressed one uh, at a time, this was 1960s, as Marie Antoinette. <laughs> so, <laughs> that it was, uh, yeah, so quite something. Um, it's the same kind of uh, impulse that one also finds when you go to, I don't know how many of you have ever made the trouble of going to um, the Owl House in uh, where is that small little town close to Graf Renet. And this was a white woman who grew up as an Afrikaner like me, a Dutch Reformed Church, um, people were very strict about what you should believe and not, and she one day decided she was going to start making uh, sculptures. She and her, um, her second uh, her, uh, colleague, Mr. Malchas, they made these fabulous statues of, um, uh, of uh, owls, of course, but also of phantasmagorical um, uh, creatures that doesn't exist in the real world. Of course, the Duomeni, the stern Duomeni apartheid South Africa, came to the house and says, no, you cannot do this, Miss Helen. You cannot make these touches because God is going to punish you. And she said, no, I have to because I see these figures and I have to make this um, for myself. And so she willed also for herself a space of freedom in a world of unfreedom. Um, and so those things are not easy to do, of course. And we so easily fall back into going with the flow because there's the peer pressure, not peer as in my name, <laughs> peer pressure. And so we often think that maybe life is going to be easier if we just go along. And maybe life will be easier, but will it really be a life that is worth living? Is it really a life that is meaningful and meaningful for you? And so even if it's sometimes difficult, I think that it is very important to always ask yourself, am I doing this? because I'm expected to do it by the university, by my lecturers, by my colleagues and my peers, um, by my partner, or am I really doing this because I know this is firstly ethically the right thing to do and I know secondly that this is what is going to give meaning to my life. 
And if, you, if you're saying that I'm only doing this because this is what other people expect me to do, and we know that sometimes it's very difficult, there are many expectations, some of them you cannot escape. But if you always only do things because that is what is expected of you, because of peer pressure, because of the discipline of the society in which you live, you're not going to be experiencing that moment of freedom. And I think that is a gift that anybody um, can give themselves to at least sometimes make that space for themselves to be truly free. So, this is maybe a quite serious thing to say at a dinner like this, but I think it's very important to, to say it because um, uh, we live in a world in which we are bombarded by information. We are bombarded by, well, if you like me, you go on Twitter, people shout at you and scream and, and try and shut you up. And of course, um, you can easily be cowed by these things and you can easily just go along with the flow and you can say what everybody else says, you can do what everybody else does. Um, and sometimes you do that because you also want to be polite and you want to be nice and you want to be liked and so you do it and it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it is important to stand back a moment and think like you be, like um, Alan Martins from the Owl House, um, like Michel Foucault. Am I really free here? Am I really making the best of my life in the way that I can? Um, and to do that, if you do that, I think, the important thing that happens is that your imagination soars. When we think about academics, um, maybe because I'm a lawyer and maybe if I was a... Um, now, should I be rude to... Uh, accountants and so on. <laughs> if I was an accountant or a lawyer, or, uh, uh, being a lawyer, or if I was an accountant or whatever, or an engineer, I would have said, imagination has nothing to do with academic excellence and with soaring. But it does. And so that imagination is an imagination that is going to be so much better if you actually are prepared sometimes at least to break some of the rules. Um, you can't always get away with breaking all the rules, so please don't say that I said you must break all the rules, but sometimes it is important to break all the, uh, some of the rules. And when you do that, there is something that might happen and you might get an imagine, you might imagine different ways, as Foucault did, of being in the world, of thinking about the world. And that imagination, whether it's in law, whether it's in accounting, whether it's in uh, engineering or in any other field, is the kind of thing that might just make you soar also on a professional level. Um, so if you're a lawyer like me, you're going to come to that case where you're going to say, the law is against me today, my client is going to lose. But then you can st 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 uh, pause for a moment and think, ah, but I can change the law. If I can think of a different way of doing this, if I can think of a different argument, I might actually convince those 11 judges on the Constitutional Court to completely change the law. This very week, uh, a, a friend of mine was involved in the case that this very week led, led to the Constitutional Court declaring um, that the use and, um, and cultivation of cannabis in private is not a criminal offense anymore. And why did that happen? Because that, the lawyer who took that case said, oh, I'm actually going to try and completely change the law. I'm not going to be contained by what the law says now. I'm going to imagine a different way of being in the world. I'm 
going to use my knowledge, my technical knowledge that the university gives me um, and th that I acquired and my professional knowledge and I'm going to use it to try and change the world. Whether you agree now with that or not, I'm <laughs> trying not to make any specific comments on it, although I did uh, chair on the judgment. Um, but if you, if you do that, I think you, two things happen. Firstly, from personal experience, I think, you become better at what you do. You become much better. And the second thing is, um, you enjoy what you do much more. And that, both of those things are important. So many, there's, there's a whole story about how you study, you have a good time when you study, or sometimes not so good time, and then you go out into the real world, you become an adult, and then you become serious, and then you basically stop enjoying the world. <laughs> That's nonsense. You have to, life is precious, and it's short, and it is important that uh, throughout your life, you do things that act, you actually enjoy in your personal life, but also in your private, uh, in your in your uh, work life. And so, in conclusion, because I didn't want to speak long, I want to um, congratulate all the people who are going to get awards tonight. I want to um, because that is very important. Excelling at things, even when other people say you excel, you take it and then you think, but I'm also good in many other ways that are not actually recognized. Um, so I want to congratulate you on that. And I also uh, want to wish you well. Um, I hope when I sit uh, this end of this year, or next year, or the year after, when I sit on the stage at the Great Hall, I don't know what we call it these days, it's, uh, no, we can't call it Jameson Hall anymore because the, the colonial. But if I sit in that hall, I hope to see you walking past. Um, the way I deal with that is uh, because it can get very long, so I always check what shoes the people wear, so I'll be checking out your shoes. Thank you very much. <laughs> dismantled and you have to start afresh in constructing your world because of uh, the gravity of the conversation that he presents before us. Now, he, Prof also spoke about things like breaking the rules of life, which is very important, but not the rules of music. <laughs> Because when you do, we have someone called Kala. And Kala will come running at you. 